it's time to go back to the 1950s and take a look and see what were they making with Bisquick at that time. I've got a complete meal planned with this cookbook, so let's go ahead and get started. This is a cute little cookbook that I picked up from a bundle on eBay, and I'm really glad that it was included because it's got some really cute little things in here. You can see here it was published in 1956, and it's got some really cute illustrations and photographs, and I really enjoy it. So for our first um, entree, we're actually gonna do this crispy fried fish. You can see here that it's really super simple, and it promises to be really good and some of the best you've ever tasted, so I'm excited for that. And to go along with it, I thought that we would go ahead and try these hush puppies with the Bisquick. Now, I've actually never made hush puppies without uh, some onion in it, and I almost added it to this, but then I decided let's stick to the actual recipe and we're gonna do it exactly like it says to do it. So I think that's gonna be really good. And then, of course, with fish, we're gonna have some coleslaw. I'm gonna keep this simple as well. I just got a small bag. Um, since it's, you know, just me and Mitch eating this, I didn't want like a whole head of cabbage and like a huge thing of uh, coleslaw. And I also keep the coleslaw really simple. Um, this was my great aunt, Mary Ruth, and I just follow her simple recipe to make a very good coleslaw. So we've got our cookbook. We've got um, pretty much all of our ingredients out and ready. So let's go ahead and get started. I went ahead and I've got um, my pot filled with oil for the hush puppies. I've also got some oil and then the recipe said put some butter in it for the fish. So as soon as we get the fish breaded um, and the hush puppies made, we'll go ahead and heat these things up and get them nice and hot. to take a little break and do an interlude of gardening footage and kind of what's been going on in the greenhouse and what I've got growing in the garden. So let me show you some of the finds that I got at a recent trip to a greenhouse and what I've been growing myself. First off, I decided to do like a little mint section because I really want to start drying some of these for some herbal teas. And one of my first finds was this orange mint. And it really does have like an orange flavor to it. It's so good. And then I also found strawberry mint. And it does taste uh, and smell like strawberries. So I really can't wait to turn this into a tea. I already have some like lemon uh, mint and some chocolate mint and that kind of thing. So, you know, it'd be fun to kind of make a little bit of a mint cocktail of flavors and just kind of um, maybe put the strawberries and chocolate together and see what that would taste like in a tea. 
I've got some chamomile that actually came back this year. I have been, every time I go past here and just see some flowers, I've been actually plucking the flowers off so that I can dry them in the kitchen. So we will be making a tea out of that shortly. Now I've kind of cleaned the greenhouse out of plants. Um, you can see I've got myself a little greenhouse cat. Um, she's in here um, pretty much anytime I have the door open. I'm growing some straw flowers in these. Um, I really just want to try straw flowers. We used to get them when I was a kid in Michigan and I really want to see if I can make it work here in Tennessee. Now you may remember these little babies. Um, I had these started from seed and you can see how they got big enough to where I needed to put them in their own pot. So I'm going to keep these um, in these and let them get a little bit bigger and then we will probably either transfer them to a bigger pot or in the garden. I haven't decided yet but some of these are going to be given away and I'll probably just keep like one of each. Oh, and we've got us a good little friend right here if you can see him. Ladybugs are great at killing aphids that will get on a lot of your herbs including chamomile. And you really want to keep these little guys on your plants and happy because they're going to make a really healthy plant for you. Now here in the herb garden, I've kind of tried to clean up uh, some of the herbs that went a little bit wild in here over, um, you know, like the beginning of spring. I am going to make a little toad habitat right here with some things I got from the Habitat Restore. And when I do that project, I'll show that to you because you really want to try to get toads in your garden. They're going to eat a ton of bad bugs for you. Now I went to a nursery and picked up this lemon verbena. You can make this into a tea and so I'd love to try that. The smell is wonderful and I love it when I come in here and you can just get a whiff of lemon and it's so wonderful. I also picked up this French lavender so we're going to put him in a pot and give that one a try. I also got some savory for, you know, chicken, pork, um, really any kind of meat it's really good on. And I went ahead and put some of uh, basil in here. It is a key lime basil, so I think that'll taste really good. And then I've got some that I started from seed growing in here as well. We've got some purple sage. Look how beautiful that looks. I also like the fact that it had this little splash of white and pink leaves. And my stevia didn't come back this year. So I went ahead and bought a replacement stevia just to get that started. Um, that's really good to flavor your teas with as well. Now some of you may remember this was filled with muscadines, but the plant just wasn't doing very well. Uh, it didn't like where it was at, so we went ahead and took it up. But decided to leave the trellis because now we can grow peas and beans on it. This year I decided to um, try these peas which the package promised me will actually be purple. Now I've done some changes to my garden this year. Um, it's going to look very different than the garden I had last year, which some of you may remember was a jungle of disorganization and overcrowding, but I'm trying to be really, really good this year. So I've got some more chamomile here in this pot. Um, I really want to try to get as much uh, tea as I can out of it. I made this. I've got like three different times in here. There's like English time, lemon time, German time. There's also some of this cilantro and I've got some basil in the back. We've got some beans coming up on this trellis. Now this is actually the doors from an old building that my parents decided to take down on their property. And so we decided to use the old doors to allow uh, climby things to have a support system. So this year it's going to be beans on this side. I decided to put my dill on this side also because as you see, 
dill can get really, really tall. So it needs to be on the north side of the garden so it doesn't uh, overshade anything else you might have growing around it. Now this is gonna be a really cool plant. I've never grown one of these before, but a fellow master gardener gave this to me and it's a loofah plant. So, you know, some of you that um, has ever, um, you know, had a loofah before to scrub with in the shower, this is the plant it comes uh, from. So I am so excited to grow my own and see how that's gonna turn out. And we have our little cucumber, and I already see a friend. I don't know if you can see, but there is a little ladybug crawling on the underside of this cucumber plant, and that's exactly what I want to see. So hopefully it's going around and eating lots of aphids. There is the perilla plant, which I can't wait to try. This tomato uh, got really big really fast. And I was also given some other uh, tomatoes by another master gardener. And so I went ahead and put them in the garden along with the little basil plants that I had grown from seed. Because if you plant basil next to your tomatoes, it will actually make your tomatoes taste better. So we are going to try that theory and see if that's true. Now we've got lettuce in here. We've also got some carrots from the UT Garden Trial um, in those two buckets. There's two different kinds. I've got some straw flowers growing in here. We've got some marigolds. Here is our onion bed. I have absolutely filled it because I really, really want to actually get some onions this year. We've got more beautiful flowers to attract pollinators and those ladybugs that you really want to get in here. And you can see these moss roses, which are some of my favorites. Um, some of the blooms have died, but we've got some new ones coming in. So these are going to be completely filled with blossoms once again. We've got some more lettuce. That is the squash that I started from seed this year and look how big and beautiful he got. And we've already got some fruit. We have a little zucchini plant here and we have a pepper box. So I usually don't have very good luck with peppers due to Tennessee being kind of a wet, humid climate, especially East Tennessee. So, I'm attempting to keep them in more of a raised box situation so the water can drain pretty quickly. But so far, they seem to be doing really well. Um, I've decorated them in hopes of uh, pleasing whatever gnome or fairy wants to come into the garden and make everything grow. And so I can't wait to see if this is actually gonna work. And then you might think this is parsley, but this is actually celery, which I'm really excited to try. They say that homegrown celery is so much better tasting than supermarket celery. And so I'm excited to try this as an experiment and see if I can get mine to grow. And that's how my garden is growing. And I hope you enjoyed that little peek into it. And now let's go ahead and rejoin the cookie. in advance for what's probably going to be some pretty bad audio. Um, I've got Mitch's phone over here um, recording, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> better 
um, than what my phone's gonna do. Uh, we both ended up having to get new phones recently because both of ours broke in different ways independently of one another. Um, but we did not realize that neither one has a phone jack. Yeah. So I cannot plug this in anymore. Um, so we're just going to make do until we go ahead and, you know, purchase another piece of equipment right. um, that will help our audio. But for now, let's just this go ahead. A little shaky. Yeah, a little shaky. But we're going to forge ahead, um, make the best out of it, and try this really good dinner because it smells awesome. Yeah. I'm going to try Hush Puppy first. Okay. <laughs> Mm. Oh my god. That is so good. That is definitely like a lot fluffier. Mm. The texture is perfect. Mm -hmm. Like, we've tried to make like homemade hush puppies before and we've never really gotten this kind of consistency with it. No, this is perfect. Um, it really does remind me of a restaurant quality. Um, mm -hmm. You know, kind of like your higher end um, seafood restaurants that have the really good hush puppies. It reminds me of that. And you know what? I don't think it would have hurt it any to add a little bit of onion. You know, like a little bit of minced onion if you yeah. really want to. Um, I think it would have improved it. Yeah. But it's awesome by itself also. Like if you just don't want to do that. I mean, either yeah. way, yeah. it's going to be a great hush puppy. Yeah. I'm shocked. Yeah. And I really just want to keep shoving this into my mouth. I'm going to try really hard to put this <laughs> down so we can go to the fish. <laughs> mm. Okay. It's just buttermilk, salt, and bisquick. That's it. And I actually really like it. It is really good. It's um, it's kind of a pleasant surprise, really, because yeah. you think, oh, it's just, you know, it can't be that special. But you know what? Just for, like, a quick meal to fry with, yeah. you know, and get your fish done and get it on uh, the table, I think it's really good. Yeah. So, I think... And number one, this cooked up pretty quick. Yeah. So this was quick. really good. Um, I had to drag him in here um, so he could watch one while I'm dropping the hush puppies in the other. Um, the only thing is, of course, it does make a little bit of a mess because you're frying, you're frying food. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to have some leftover oil to contend with. You're going to have a little bit of some mess on your oven. And just by nature of the meal, like making it, I did dirty quite a few dishes. Right, right. So you're going to have, you know, but you're going to have a bit of a mess. I don't think any other, like, fried fish recipe is going to turn out any different. Though. No, I mean, it's, it's just the nature, nature of frying. Nature of frying food, yeah. yeah. So, but for a simple dinner that cooks up really quick, this is a good one. Yeah. So, kudos to Bisquick that um, has stayed, uh, apparently, been making it for decades now. I actually thought this was a pretty recent incarnation. Like, you know, <laughs> 70s, 80s, that's kind of what I was thinking. Um, but this one goes back, like I showed you before, to 1956. Right. So, we know it's older than that. I would love to know what's the ingredients difference between 56 and today like if it is any different yeah, yeah if it is it might not be um but it's just as good and easy to use with these recipes as i'm sure it would have been in 1956. Yeah. Yeah. so yeah this and that's one reason why i love these little um cookbook pamphlets from corporations you know like food corporations because you usually find some pretty good hidden gems um, with their product. Yeah. So. And they definitely are like, I would just say that they are a nice shortcut. Like, you could always do this. Yeah. Without Bisquick. Right. But you would have to mix all the flour and stuff, like, equally, right? Yeah. And everything yourself. And that's always going to take a little bit longer than doing it with just... Right. So if you oh, and by the way, this video isn't sponsored no. by Bisquick. <laughs> But I 
I just, might sound like it. I know, <laughs> but I just like the fact that if you do need a time saver, you do have it. Yeah. And the old recipes stand up with the new incarnation of the product. Yeah. So I actually really think that's cool. If you find this on eBay, you know, grab it for a couple dollars. I think you'll really like it. And just know it still works with today's biscuit. Yeah. So that's really cool. So thank you for watching this episode. Really hope you've forgiven us for the audio. I promise we will try to get that fixed um, before next episode. And really hope you tried this because it is so good and easy. And for next month, we're going full library book sale extravaganza. So <laughs> we bought so many, um, which you will see in a Monday's episode, <laughs> that we are going to have to just push through the summer with nothing but library book sale finds. Yeah. So it's going to be kind of fun to see what can you get for really cheap at your library book sale that's going to be a great cookbook. So stay tuned for that and thanks for watching this one. We'll see you. Bye. And if you like historical cooking and unusual cookbooks, here's two more videos you might enjoy. And make sure to like and subscribe for more foodie adventures.